If you look at like, where delivery speed's going, it's only getting faster, and it's moving towards same day and eventually two hour. Mark Laurie is the CEO of Walmart e-commerce, a position he stepped into after selling his startup, Jet.com, to the retail giant for $3.3 billion in 2016. Since then, Mark's been on the front lines of the biggest battle in retail, the competition between Walmart and Mark's old company, Amazon, to win over the world's customers. We talked about how he's melding his startup culture with Walmart's and lessons learned as he crafts the future of retail. It's been one year since you joined Walmart. I'd love to get an understanding of what you have learned about life inside Walmart. Anything that's surprised you or that has caught you off guard? This is sort of the second time around working inside a big company in the retail space. And uh, I have to say I've been really pleasantly surprised at how good and genuine the people are inside Walmart. People are... Uh, genuine, authentic, have incredible respect for the individual. They're thinking about, you know, diversity and inclusion in the environment in ways that have, in companies that I've never worked for, quite frankly. Also, the speed at which we've been able to move is something that I never would have expected. So it feels like a startup. Yeah, you don't think about Walmart and speed being together. Yeah. You think about low prices, you think about, yeah. you know, massive gatherings, do you think about bringing down supplier costs? Is the speed something that you brought into Walmart, or is this something that you have, that they were already embracing before you arrived? Well, I don't know about what it was like before, but I can tell you that they've really done what's necessary to set us up for success and to move fast, and that's really around empowerment and trust. What was the first six months like in trying to get that into place? Yeah, I think I like the first six months, a lot of it was really being crystal clear about the vision, where we're going, and how we're going to get there, mm -hmm. and then just keep telling the same message over and over. So I spent a lot of time making sure that we really got that nailed early on. And then also just reorganizing the business to move for speed. We made the organization flatter, more customer centric. So I took like the customer service function, which was two levels down as a direct report. I took the customer experience function, which was two levels down, I made a direct report because just to enable us to get me closer to the people that are close to the customer and also to be able to move faster. So flattening the organization was a big part. When people are looking at this, at all of the uh, acquisitions that you've made in your first year, what are you looking for in these, in these retailers you're purchasing? So I would say to date, it's really been a uh, two-pronged approach on M&A. First is, the first bucket is really around, are there specialty retailers out there, like a Moose Jaw, Hay Needle, or Shoe Buy, that have deep merchandising expertise, great product content, and great relationships with vendors that they can help accelerate onto both Walmart and Jet. And the other side is the sort of Bonobos, Mod Cloth, these digitally native vertical brands. Um, and that's really about you know thinking longer term about how we're going to dif differentiate our assortment from the competition. You talk about the competition and you're going deep into the long tail. I think everyone assumes that what you're talking about there is Amazon. This is an incredibly intense battle. Uh, at least from the outside, it looks that way. I'm curious, how much time do you think about what Amazon is doing and going up against yeah, the machine. Yeah, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about the competition. Um, I'm really focused on how do, we, how do we leverage the assets we have to do things for the customer that no one else can. So one of the things that Walmart's done even before I got here, but is really starting to accelerate now, is this grocery pickup business, which is now in a 1,000 stores. Um, we've got an 87 net promoter score, which is off the charts. So customers absolutely love it. We pick the groceries and put it in the trunk of your car at amazing prices. We've got that in a thousand stores now and we're starting to accelerate that um, across the US. That picking capability is, is really hard to do at that sort of uh, service level. But now that we have that, we're starting to do delivery out of 22 of these stores using a combination of Uber, Postmates, and even our own associates. So we've got a pilot going where we allocate packages to our associates based on minimizing their distance off wherever they're going after work. So that's worked out really well. Would and, you talk about that first? Because I remember when that was announced, yeah. and it was pretty shocking to think about this this concept. What have you learned so far? Is it working? Is it not working? Is it? Are there any lessons that you've picked up from that? Yeah, it's working really well. The average amount of distance that uh, an associate has to travel off their commute home is less than a quarter of a mile to deliver a package because we purposely allocate them to try to minimize it. Right. So, you know, being able to know where each associate is going to go after work. 
um, and then be able to allocate the packages in the most efficient way is proven to be, you know, super interesting to so us. So someone, they're on their way home, they just do a little detour, they drop off a package, and then they That's go it. wherever they're And, and they're getting paid from the time they leave the store till the time they deliver the package. So on a marginal, like, wage basis for the amount of time over and above your normal commute, it looks great. Right. So associates are happy, and at the same time, we get to deliver it for a fraction of the price that it would be to a point-to-point, -point, you know, crowdsource partner. So we're really excited about that. But I mean, just the idea of having 4,600 stores where product is basically getting to these store locations in full truck low quantities, so you can't get product there any cheaper. And then these 4,600 stores that are doubling as warehouses are profitable, right? So every marginal dollar that ships out of there comes out at, at, a, at a profit margin that really can't be matched. So in terms of if you look at like, where delivery speed's going, it's only getting faster, and it's moving towards same day, and eventually two hour, nobody's set up better than Walmart to deliver on that experience at the lowest possible cost. The race for the last mile seems to be the biggest race in retail right now. How do we get someone a package as fast as possible? And beyond just the stores, there's questions of drones, bike delivery. Do you think it gets to a point where consumers just assume that everything they buy is gonna get to them within 20 minutes, an hour, how fast do you think things get? Certainly within, within a couple hours, but for limited assortment of products, so when I say limited assortment, still it could be 100,000 products, and that's why I think we're best suited to deliver that because we already have more than 100,000 products in 4,600 locations. When you start talking about product assortment that goes into the hundreds of thousands or millions, obviously then speed becomes a lot harder because you can't have a million products in 4,600 locations. That doesn't economically make sense. So it does the speed certainly for the top 100,000, and then in certain urban areas you can do it in a much larger assortment. But um, at some point you just reach the limit of you know, the sheer distance that products need to move. One big difference between what you're doing and, and, and where Amazon is looking is you're definitely a much more people-focused business. You have a lot of associates. And Amazon seems to be much more focused on automation, trying to get things with the fewest amount of people possible. Do you think that people have to be in the mix, or would you prefer it to be a more automated process? Yeah, I think it's a combination of both. I think in certain cases, technology makes sense, um, and in others, you, you can't beat the, the human element. And so I think getting that right balance is really what we're striving for. And uh, you know, leveraging our assets and, and the human talent wherever possible, like in the case of associate delivery, is a great example. You've got the focus on customers. It's definitely an area that uh, Walmart has not been known for in the past. Do you think you need to change people's perception of Walmart? Yeah, I mean, I've been really impressed with what I've seen so far in terms of the strides that have been making in store uh, with these academies and you know, mm -hmm. training associates and the increase in wages that happened a couple of years back. Um, I think Greg and team have done a great job of really starting to invest more into the stores and the experience. That coupled with you know, having Jet.com focus on the urban millennial higher income, I think both those brands working together, especially in you know, the online space, I think is a winning strategy. But you think you need to have a separate brand to go after the millennials? You couldn't do it with Walmart? Not necessarily millennials, but the higher income urban millennial. I think the New York City, San Francisco crowd. I think having a brand that's laser focused on that audience, because it is a different audience, works really well. I mean, I think it dovetails really nicely with the Walmart brand as well. Um, and the fact that we're sharing the same back-end infrastructure means you're getting all the same leveraging scale uh, in a way that you would if you were just a single brand. Under you, you have Jet.com and you have Walmart. Yeah. In your career in startups, you've built new brands. You get to form people's impression for what to expect from diapers.com. What's it like going into something where the brand perception has already been formed, where you can't create a new perception from scratch. Yeah, no, I think it's a fun challenge. It's definitely different. I think we're starting to do that. I mean, we have a, we're making a big push to elevate the walmart.com brand, and we've already started to do some things, which you'll see a lot more in the coming year. We just moved to colored blue boxes. So if you order from Walmart, um, they're cycling through now, you'll get a nice colored blue box. We're redesigning the entire website that should hit, you know, probably in Q1. We're making partnerships to bring premium assortment onto the site, and we're investing heavily in the shopping experience in both the home and fashion category, which are two categories where uh, I think we have the ability to do, do a lot um, around the experience. Why so those two categories? Those categories are more um, less transactional. You could actually create uh, an experience. They're really around browse. And so if you're shopping for a home, you know, we don't want it to be where you just come in and, oh, I need a bar stool. We want you to come in and say, hey, I'm decorating my living room. What are the things I need? And be able to see different rooms set up um, and be able to purchase the entire 
suite of, of products um, at whatever style you want. So be able to search, oh, you like modern? Great. Here's some living rooms in some modern styles. Find something you like and then buy everything. It's, it's less transactional and more about the experience. So much of what you've done has been focused on the repeat buyer and getting people a super easy, easy way to get things that they, want, that they need to buy even before they realize that they're almost out of the product. Yeah. Doesn't this take you in a different direction? That's why it's, it's, it's a barbell strategy. Uh -huh. you know? It's at the one end, yeah, it's about you know, building the relationship with the customer with the everyday essentials and make it really easy for them to get the stuff that they need every day. And at the other end of the barbell, it's investing in that um, browse and less transactional experience, like home and, and, and apparel slash fashion. What's your involvement with different parts of the company? When yeah, did you come I'm, into I'm the process? I'm an entrepreneur, so I, I definitely like to you know, dive deep on lots of areas that I think could potentially have a big impact. And sometimes they may seem you know, like they're relatively small, but in the big picture, um, my belief is some of the small things make the biggest impacts. But there are certain things that I like to have my you know, fingerprints on. And it's usually the, the little things that could be that last 5% that can make a difference in the brand. That's where I'll tend to dive deep. You worked at, at Amazon. Are there different pieces that you have learned along the way that you incorporate into how you manage, how you think about vision, how you set strategy? I keep learning the same lessons over and over again, um, and it always comes back to culture and people. Like anytime something's not working well, um, it's usually because you don't have the right people and you're not getting the right people because you don't have the right culture. So how do you create a culture within Jet.com, within Walmart.com, and within Walmart? Yeah, I think it's really important to sort of think hard about the values of the company and what you want to stand for. So like, what's an example? And so example, so it's trust, transparency, and fairness. Those were the three values at Jet. We had a compensation system that was open. Everyone could see what everyone else was making. And at every level in the company, people made the same amount. So man, woman, didn't matter. Like, you were a director in the company, you made 150,000 plus stock, and that was it. There was no negotiation. That was the level, and everyone knew everyone was making at that level. Uh, Did that work? It worked amazingly well. Do you still do it? We don't, well, now that we're part of Walmart, it was tough because there were thousands of people. It was just tougher to do. Yeah. But we did it up until the acquisition. Yeah, but don't you have you know superstar data scientists who come in and say, like, I can, make magic at your company, but you got to pay me what I'm worth. The LeBron Jameses, the, 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 you didn't have that experience of saying, we're going to have to pay more. Yeah, maybe, maybe it would be at a different level then. Uh -huh. But everybody at the same level made the same amount. Are there any retail startups that, you, that you're looking at now and just so impressed by? Yeah, this, I mean, there's a lot of them. Um, because we're in the, also the hunt for acquisitions and things, it's hard to give you specific names. All but right. there's a lot of impressive companies and impressive founders out there. We're spending a lot of time um, with these founders. Is there anything in particular you're looking for when you are talking to founders? I'm looking for founders that have been able to create a culture and have you know, been able to recruit and retain amazing talent. Hmm. That says it all. That goes back to my previous point.